Ruins of a Silent World, by Stephen Lake. Mark's eyes shot open with a start as he awoke suddenly. He then sat bolt upright and began to look around frantically for answers to the mysteries that were filling his mind. Where was he? Who was he? Where was this place? Why was he here? A thick, pea-soup-like fog clouded his senses as he tried to grasp for answers to the waves of questions that were filling his mind. Eventually he came to realize that he was sitting in the middle of an endless desert that bore no resemblance to anything he knew or remembered. He soon stood up and shook off the sand that covered his body, and filled nearly every crack and crevice of it. The crazy stuff had even gone up his sinuses, forcing him to blow his nose repeatedly, as hard as he could, to clear it, which made it feel like he was trying to dislodge a sheet of coarse grain sandpaper as he did. He eventually succeeded. The only problem now was that he desperately needed a bath. But, in this desert, that would be a luxury he couldn't enjoy, as there wasn't any water anywhere as far as the eye could see. He then turned, and turned, and turned as he looked around the area, but couldn't tell in which direction he needed to go. He then looked at the horizon and realized that the sun had already set some hours earlier. He then looked up and saw a colorful trilogy of moons hanging brightly in the sky above him as they lit up the landscape in a gentle collage of rainbow-colored light. Eventually, deciding that there was no one preferable direction to go in, he settled on climbing to the top of the nearest dune to have a look around. At least up there would give him a better idea of where he was, and what direction he should go in. The climb to the top, however, was slow, tiring, and took nearly every ounce of his strength to achieve. Eventually, after a long, difficult, and draining struggle, he reached the summit and then lay down in the cool, desert air for several minutes to catch his breath. Once he'd recovered, he stood up and looked across the area. To his surprise, he found himself near what appeared to be a collection of ancient, abandoned ruins that were not unlike the pyramids of Egypt. He soon headed in the direction of the ruins in hopes that they might provide him with some degree of shelter from the growing cold of the desert air. Eventually he stumbled upon a sight that surprised him. Spread out before him sat dozens upon dozens of square concrete boxes that were embedded in the colorful desert sands around him. However, these boxes didn't appear to have been formed naturally. Instead, they looked like the foundation of buildings that had been dug into the sand to provide their owners with a cool place to both store food, as well as escape the scorching heat of the day. As he came upon the first of the foundations, he was surprised to discover a tunnel extending out from it. For what purpose it was there, he didn't know. But, he had his theories. However, that would have to wait for another time as he had more pressing issues at the moment. As he continued on, he soon spotted something that made him pause. He bent down and then brushed lightly at what appeared to be signs of excavation. And not just any excavation. They looked like those that would be made at an archaeological dig site. He perked up at this in curiosity as foggy, clouded memories began to pick at the edges of his mind. He then turned and looked up at the triple moons above him, before looking off at the distant pyramids. Wherever this was, it certainly wasn't Earth, a fact that he was slowly coming to realize. But, if this wasn't Earth, then where was he? Just then the wind shifted, bringing with it the smell of a sea. Upon sensing this, he immediately turned in the direction of the smell as it quickly faded away. Was he really near water? Or even an ocean? Sea water wasn't necessarily the best thing for him to be drinking right now. However, where there was once civilization, there was also always some source of fresh water. Societies couldn't survive without ample quantities of it. He then looked at the foundation next to him, and the tunnel leading away from it. While it wasn't safe for him to climb down into it, as he'd have no way to get out, he was beginning to wonder if the foundation he was seeing was actually for a house, or if it instead had some higher, more important purpose. Either way, he needed water, and soon. So that would be his first priority. Answering all of the other burning questions that were filling his mind could come later. He then wandered around the area for several hours as he tried in vain to find the source of the odors that he had smelled earlier. That ocean had to be somewhere nearby, or else the scent of it wouldn't have survived on the wind long enough to reach him. Even so, the hunt for it was proving to be very draining. 
Therefore, to conserve energy, he did his best to keep on top of the dunes as he slowly navigated across them until he eventually came to a large, stone hilltop which rose triumphantly out of the thick, rolling desert sand. As he crested its highest point, he was shocked to see what looked like a gigantic, bioluminescent ocean in the distance. Clearly what he'd been smelling earlier had not been simply his imagination. He then quickly climbed down from the stone hilltop and made his way towards the ocean in hopes of finding a stream that could provide him with a much-needed drink of water. He eventually came upon a beach that sat on the edge of a large, glowing blue, diamond-like ocean that crashed gently onto a black, sandy beach in front of him in gentle, puffy waves. Despite its incredible beauty in the light of the triple moons, he continued to focus on finding fresh water. Eventually he spotted what looked like a tunnel not far away, out of which poured a stream of icy cold river water that flowed rapidly across the beach and into the ocean beyond. Drawn by a driving thirst, he closed quickly on it. Upon arriving, he discovered a small shed standing next to it. Peeking inside, he found a variety of shovels and tools, as well as several large drinking glasses. He wasn't sure how the shed had gotten there, or why it even existed. But, that question could be answered at another time, as he desperately needed a drink. Grabbing one of the cups, he raced over to the river, and availed himself to the delicious, fresh, clear spring water that flowed out of the tunnel. After he had fully satisfied his thirst, he went back to the shed, found a large bottle inside, complete with a carrying strap, and immediately filled it before turning and retracing his steps. Hopefully, as he made his way back, he could eventually find where the river, and this tunnel, had originated from, and possibly some human life with it as well. After several hours of walking, he found his way back to the mysterious alien pyramids, and the basements with tunnels that surrounded them. But as he did, the wind shifted, and this time, instead of smelling ocean, he detected the scent of fresh water. Turning and following the odor as best he could, he soon came across a large river flowing through the desert near one of the pyramids. He found this strange, as he wasn't entirely certain how he'd not seen that the first time. But, given how he'd been feeling at that moment, he could have easily walked right past New York City and completely missed it. Curious to where the river led, he walked along its sandy shores until he came upon a place where the river took a sharp left turn, and then disappeared into the desert sands. However, upon closer examination, he realized that the river hadn't actually vanished, but was instead pouring into one of the basement-like structures he'd found earlier, and out through a tunnel that was built into one of its walls, much in the same way as the others he'd found previously. So that's what those were for, he thought to himself. Clearly his earlier theory had proven to be correct. However, he wasn't entirely sure why there would be so many of them in the area or why they were even needed in the first place. But, given their perceived purpose, he surmised that they were some kind of emergency drainage system that had been created to protect the larger structures in the area from unwanted erosion that would lead to their collapse. This would be especially important if the river ever flooded, which it likely did from time to time, given the presence of these structures, and their proximity to both the river and the pyramids. After refilling his water bottle in the river, he turned his attention to the pyramid closest to him. After walking for a short distance, he noticed that light was beginning to appear on the horizon. Hmm, if the sun is rising there, then that must be east, he thought to himself. He would need to log that away in his mind for later use. He then made his way up to the foot of the pyramid and was impressed at its massive structure and the size of the individual blocks that it was made of. In many ways it reminded him of the pyramid at Giza back on Earth. He initially looked around for signs of an entrance into it, but found nothing. However, after some more exploring, he eventually came upon a door in its side, and approached it. As he did, he noticed two peculiar things about it. One, there were lights on inside, and two, there were footprints everywhere. Curious of this, he bent down and lightly brushed one of the footprints. They looked to have been made within the last day or two. So, whoever it was that had made them, hopefully they were still around, and alive. He then glanced back at his own footprints and found them to be identical in design. This made him feel better. Whoever these other footprints belonged to, they were just like him. Well, whoever, and whatever he was. 
that was the next big challenge he'd need to overcome. Namely, recovering all of his lost memories. But first he had to find out who lived here. So quietly, and carefully, he made his way through the door, and into a tunnel on the other side that was lined with rows upon rows of strange, alien hieroglyphs that depicted scenes of daily life that would not be out of place had he found them back home on Earth. However, as he continued to walk, a striking realization slowly dawned on him. It was the lighting in the tunnel. This made him pause, and then look up at the ceiling. As strange as it was to see them in this place of all places, the fact that they even existed at all was more confusing. This is because, unlike normal lighting, these had no obvious point of origin. Confused by this, he walked over to the wall, placed his hand over one of them, and was surprised when the light in the hallway didn't change. It was as though the lights he was seeing all around him weren't actually illuminating the tunnel itself. Instead they appeared to be no different than the dots of light that you might find on a television screen, real to the eyes, but not actually part of what illuminated the tunnel. He was completely perplexed by this. How could these lights exist, and yet provide no actual illumination to the tunnel? And, if they weren't actually lighting the tunnel, then what was? The walls certainly weren't. And yet everything he saw said they were. This tore at his reason like a wild cat rending the flesh of its prey. How could something exist, yet not exist, and light the entire hallway, without actually lighting the hallway? After a bit he closed his eyes and shook his head. If he didn't stop thinking about this, it was gonna break his brain. Deciding to continue on deeper into the pyramid, he followed the tunnel until he found a series of branching hallways. Turning down one of them, he soon came across a strangely familiar sight. Embedded in one of the walls, as though painted there, was a simple, glass-windowed, wooden office door. Hung rather lazily in the middle of the glass window was a note that read, Break Room. Mark furrowed his brow at this. Deciding to explore further, he cautiously opened the door and stepped through. On the other side he found a plump, dark-skinned, older man sitting at a large, wooden desk wearing a night watchman's uniform that looked as though it had been snatched straight out of a 1950s dime store movie. Upon hearing Mark enter, the man behind the desk looked up in surprise, and then excitement at seeing him. Mark! You're alive, buddy! We thought you were dead, cried the man excitedly. Mark! Yes, that was his name. And the man behind the desk was. Frederick, he replied. Yeah, man, it's me. Oh, brother, I'm so glad to see you. After that last wave went through while you were out, we all thought you were dead. Buddy, it's so good to see you alive. Man, I've gotta tell the others, said the older man. Just then Mark's mind filled with memories of a glowing, undulating, wave-like horror that was accompanied by feelings of sheer terror, causing him to sway and struggle just to keep himself on his feet. Seeing this, Frederick looked at him in concern. You okay, buddy? Want me to get you a doctor? Thankfully those guys are still alive, or we'd all be dead by now, he said. Mark pondered this for a bit, and then shook his head. No, I'm fine. I'm just, trying to deal with something, he replied. Nah, man, you need a doctor. Let me get one for you, said Frederick. No, no, you don't have to do that. However, despite Mark's protests, Frederick did exactly that. After being checked over thoroughly by the doctors, and given a clean bill of health, with the single caveat that he needed to get some rest, Mark made his way to the dining hall. After eating a quick meal, he then found a couch, crawled up on it, and immediately fell asleep. He was awoken several hours later by the sound of activity in another room. Deciding that he needed to get out of the pyramid, and get some fresh air, he made his way across the sun-scorched desert, and over to the motor pool. As he signed out one of the motorcycles, a familiar man approached him. Hey, Mark, going somewhere, he asked. Mark turned and noticed that it was his friend Lemurx. Yeah, I'm going for a ride to have a look around, he said. Lemurx looked briefly at his watch, and then smiled. We have another nine hours until the next wave, so you should be okay to go out if you want. 
and, even if you don't get back in time, this one's likely to be another glancing blow, right around sundown or so, exactly like it was last night. Just then more memories began to return to him. He'd been outside stargazing just after sundown, and had forgotten that another wave was scheduled to arrive just after sunset. Normally he would be inside when those came through. But last night he'd stayed out far too long and had gotten caught by the wave as it had passed over him. The fact that it had been merely a glancing blow, just like Lemerx had said, was the only reason he'd survived. If it had been a direct hit, there wouldn't have been enough left of him to fill a matchbook. As he pondered this, his memories continued to return. Eventually he remembered what the waves were, and why they were so dangerous. When he had first come to this world just less than a year earlier, as part of a regular rotation of xenoarchaeologists who were studying the planet, the local star had been completely normal, quiet, and really no different than the one that warmed his homeworld of Earth. However, within the first six months after arriving on the planet, the same star began acting strange. Shortly after this it started releasing powerful pulse waves of energy that struck the planet, and wiped out over half of the teams, their homes, vehicles, and anything else that had been outside and unprotected when they'd come through. He, and those who still remained, and had survived, had been working inside the pyramids when the first waves came through, and were thus protected from harm and death by their massive stone structures. But now they were trapped on the planet, as the fleets of Earth, knowing the danger of approaching the planet because of the waves, would not risk trying to save them. They had already attempted this once, and nearly lost the entire rescue fleet as a result. So, until the waves quit, if that ever happened, they were on their own, trapped on the planet, with no hope of rescue or resupply. So for him, and the others of his team, it was now just a matter of time before their supplies ran out, and they all starved to death. With his memories having fully returned to him, he was beginning to wish they hadn't, as he would have preferred not remembering this terrible and demoralizing fact. He sighed as he thought about this, and then glanced briefly at the door before looking back at his friend. Yeah, I only expect to be out there for a couple hours. I want to do a little looking around to see what I can find before heading back here for the night, he said. Lemurks furrowed a brow at this. Want some company? I'm looking for an excuse to get out of the complex and go somewhere else today, or really anywhere that's not here, he said. Mark grinned. I understand that feeling. So yeah, let's go. The two of them then got on their motorcycles and headed out into the desert, their quantum-powered electric motors whining noisily as they raced down one of the service roads that led away from the pyramids, and the dig sites that surrounded them. Eventually the two men came to a crossroads where they found a half-melted road sign that looked like it had seen better days. Pulling up to the sign they stopped, and then stare out across a flat, barren landscape that looked to have once been settled, or at least prepared to be such. Just then, as he sat on his bike, images of a village, filled with houses, began to flood his mind. Rows upon rows, streets upon streets, as far as the eye could see, spread out in every direction in front of him. However, as his mind slowly returned to reality, the images he was seeing of the once populated city vanished, and were replaced by a grid work of empty, barren streets, empty slabs, and dozens of half-melted, battered street signs. This caused his heart to ache with a loss so deep that he wished he could forget it all. It's a darn shame, this place, said Lemmings. Thousands of people living, working, and raising families here, only to be completely vaporized when those blasted waves started happening. It's too bad the star guys couldn't see this coming. Nobody would have died if they had. Mark tilted his head slightly as he thought about this. The waves, the planet, the reason he was here, and everything else. It all came back to him in one gigantic, migraine inducing rush. EBS Epsilon AF4. That was the planet they were on. It was an Earth-like world located deep in the Pegasus galaxy that was orbiting a slowly dying star. He'd come all the way to this place to study the planet, and its vast collection of strange, abandoned ruins as one of the many xenoarchaeologists who had been assigned to this project. However, that was back before the local star had begun its final death throes. What he couldn't understand is why they, the astrophysicists who had been assigned to study this system's primary star, 
Haddon spotted its slowly failing health that was now putting the lives of himself, and his fellow archaeologists, in mortal danger. Because of their failure, he and the others were now living through the final days of EBS Epsilon AF4 and its parent star, and there was nothing they could do to save themselves, nor could anyone else. Yeah, I know. And here we are, the survivors, just waiting for our time to run out. I wish the fleet would find a way to rescue us before we all die, he said. Lemurk sighed. Yeah, man, I know. But, from what we were told, that's not gonna ever happen. Apparently those waves have the ability to completely obliterate any ship they encounter. The last time the fleet contacted us, they said they were still trying to come up with a way to save us. But, from all I've heard, there's little chance that'll ever happen. And, so long as it's too risky for them to come and get us, we're just gonna be on our own until the end comes, he replied. Mark frowned. I know. And we've even sent them everything we have on those pyramids, and how they've been able to protect us from being exterminated like everyone else was. Hopefully the eggheads back at fleet headquarters can figure out something and get us out of here before we all die. Lemurk snorted. Fat chance. If they haven't found anything yet, they likely never will, he retorted. Mark frowned. As much as he wanted to remain positive, and hopeful of rescue, he had to admit that his friend was right. They had little chance of surviving, or being rescued, and the thought of that was killing him inside, little by little, every single day as they all waited in hopelessness for the day when it'd be their turn to die. To make matters worse, every one of their ships, shuttlecraft, and other space-capable vessels, had been destroyed in the first wave. If any of them had survived, even if his chances of succeeding were slim at best, he would have been willing to take the risk just on the vain hope of escaping. And, even if he failed, he could say that he'd at least tried. After all, doing so was better than just waiting here to die. Unfortunately, that was all they had left to look forward to. He then revved the bike's motor briefly, turned, and looked over at his friend. Come on, man. Let's head back. There's nothing left for us out here. It's just a barren landscape, on a dying world on which we're trapped, that will soon turn us into nothing more than desiccated museum pieces for future archaeologists to discover, study, catalog, and put on display, just like the pyramids in which we hide, he said glumly. Lemmings thought about this briefly and then grinned. And what if the fleet somehow finds a way to rescue us? What then? he asked. Mark thought about this for several moments, and then smirked. I'm probably going to find a different line of work. Xenoarchaeology is far too dangerous. Lemons grinned. Buddy, if we survive this, I'm gonna be right there with you. Mark chuckled. And what job would you want to do if you did change careers? Lemmix laughed. Probably something safe, boring, and far away from here. Mark grinned at this. Amen to that. The end.